What do you recommend carnivore to everyone if many ancestral diets had carbs all year round, especially in warmer climates? Well, they didn't actually have all year round, Jason. Um, people's, people's basically, that's more recent times. For the majority of our existence as a species, and there is N15 data to back what I'm saying, actual real data, not, not you know, anecdotes or people's opinions, because other people have opinions, and that's fair enough. They can have their opinions on anything. But uh, the, the major we've only had three very warm interglacial periods for the Homo sapiens sapiens. So that was about 200 odd thousand years ago. Our species has sort of existed for three and a half, 350,000 years, more or less, based on the most recent archaeological evidence. And about 200 odd thousand years, we were in around that period in uh, uh, a short interglacial period, which was warmer. Most of the other periods has been glacial, and there's been frost all the way down to the tropics. So not many plants around under those conditions. So the majority of our existence, we've existed on a planet with very little access to plants, not even seasonal for the majority of our time. We had an interglacial period that actually changed our APOE phenotype. That's how we know that it's associated. It's, it was a protective mechanism to reduce micron uptake. And I've done a video, if you go under Pim Johnson, I actually cover the APOE thoroughly right through, and I'm not going to cover it here because that, that's a long video. You can go through and actually understand it. But basically, it actually slowed down the uptake of remnant micron in order to not cause, you know, sort of Randall cycle inflammation type in the actual liver. So when you're consuming a very small amount of um, a carbohydrate, which would have been in that interglacial period. After that, it was around, the next one was about 80-odd thousand years, another, um, and that's when we shifted to the APOE22, a proportion of the population. It's become more pronounced in certain populations that have been grain-eating populations. Again, it shows that mixing fat and carbs together is not a good thing it's contraindicated and the body had to there had to be some genetic adaptations to those interglacial periods of very small amounts of intake so our high amounts of intake nowadays are very contraindicated and not a good thing and now we're in another interglacial period um, which is slightly warmer and as a consequence and we know it's slightly warmer because we got more flooding back around um, uh, quite a few thousand years, uh, about, what was it, about 10, 12,000 years ago, we had a, when a lot of the actual weather changed on the planet. And that's when we actually got two seasons in the tropics um, in terms of food, and, uh, in terms of carbs, two seasons, and one season in the more temperate type climates, um, which is about, towards the end of the, the year and all that. Most plants are seasonal, very little, and most modern-day plants that we consume today didn't even exist in the past. You know, ninety plus, more than 90% are basically all man-made since agriculture. They didn't exist, basically. If you go back and look, even, you know, broccoli, which is a big thing, you know, the flower, it's, you know, a little plant which is looks like a parsley very different, radically different. So the only things that we had access was things like little berry type things. That was it. We took these little berry type things and made them into big fruit like that. They did not exist. Watermelon in Africa is a little thing like that, very fibrous. It's got more water. It's a, more used as a water source rather than a fruit. It's a fruit but it's more fibrous with a lot of water in it and people use it as a water source. But it wasn't used basically as a fruit. So all this nonsense that people talk about that we had carbs, our ancestors and all that, no. You know, these were basically, um, you know, man-made, the modern stuff that we've got. None of it's actually, you know, if you look at the 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 ones in the, and, and most of it is dangerous and very poisonous, will kill you, you know. 
So we had to learn through agriculture how to handle it, how to, um, you know, modify it. You know, like some of them have got very high levels of, uh, you know, certain types of like cyanide and stuff like that. And we had to learn through agriculture to modify like some of these tubers to get rid of a lot of this excess cyanide and a lot of these other things that are, would make you sick. So it's through agriculture that we're able to modify these things and then make them available to us. Prior to that, you know, which is prior to, you know, if we start agriculture, you're looking at basically about 5,005, uh, probably, no, let's go right back to the very early stages. You're probably looking at about 11 plus thousand years ago, which is a blink, which is nothing in the evolutionary time span. But actual tillage, that means the ability to till and actually ha shift more of the diet towards agric to agricultural products or grains and stuff like that, happened about three and a half, um, five and a half thousand years ago, three and a half um, thousand BC. So that's in the, the sort of the fertile plain as it was called so basically no it hasn't been the case at all and even in the tropics it's basically seasonal and it would be been these little small berries that don't have a lot of sugar in them and all that i've actually eaten like in indonesia i've actually eaten sort of wild type varieties compared to the the actual stuff that a agri you know farmers produce but the actual wild stuff and i can say the tart the tart, they don't have a lot of sweetness to them and they don't have a lot of sugar to them. They're very tart and people don't like them. But I, you know, and if you take a look at the early apples as well, small and tart, not very sweet. You know, so, and they were seasonal, you know, one season or two seasons in the tropics. So you didn't have a lot of access. That's the reality. So you've got to get your mindset away from this is modern food supply. That's not what existed back then you have to go and look at the history of of, of plants then you'll realize that you've been bullshitted at big time but one thing that we know animals on the other hand have been around for a very long time g'day lukey hello harry hello everyone yeah so it's just it's just bullshit mate the n15 is quite you know, in the interglacial periods, the lowest level in the tropics, which we find with the collagen long bones, which are not well preserved, unfortunately, because of the tropical environment, but the amount that we find, the small amount, they show levels of 70 to 80% coming from animal foods. That's where you're getting more plants because you've got more access to two seasons. And on the other hand, I mean, if you go into the temperate areas it sort of drops all the way down to you know 80 to 90 and the further north you go it goes up to 100 percent nearly and they and this is and this is basically through the majority of t majority of time and a lot of this sort of stuff is well worked out we know that even the type of protein and where it's coming from, not even what animal it's coming from, because it, we look at the delta, th um, the the delta thirteen carbon isotope, which indicates that it comes from a grass. Now, when you've got very low N fourteen, which is the nitrogen in plants, and you've got high N fifteen, and high delta thirteen. Um, carbon it indicates that it can only come from a ruminant that it was eating grass so that's the dominant food that we actually consumed whether it was a mammoth or whatever it was it was a it was a um a terrestrial at large animal of one sort or another that we were consuming most of the time and you know and those warmer patches you know our levels would drop down would be down to 70 percent and because animals are leaner, you know, when you're in the interglacial periods and in those interglacial periods, you become super carnivore, which is sort of 70 plus percent. 
is called a super carnivore. And you, that's why we use the term super carnivore and hyper carnivore. Super carnivore is much lower. Hyper carnivore is 90 or to 100%, but that's in the more glacial periods, which is the majority of time. You know, and that's the important part here, the distinguishing point, you know. And if you've got a big damn mammoth you break down and you can feast on that, why would you waste a lot of energy trying to find some little bits of plants? Even Mary that went out with the with the actual Mary Runner, with the um, uh, the Hudza, where she was going, and they get some. The only stuff that they actually get is some seasonal tubers and some seasonal um, fruit, and that's it. They don't bother with any of the other plants. And for the obvious reasons, and a, and a bit of seasonal honey, and the only reason they do that is because they're actually, without realising, because animals now are leaner in these warmer interglacial periods. So you, only, you don't get as much fat as you would have got from a mammoth back then. You're getting a one, you know, you're not getting the two to one ratio, you're getting the one to one ratio or slightly less sometimes. And so in order to basically maintain fat stores, which is really important for humans, that's why we are who we are. We've got massive big fat stores compared to other animals. It allows us to basically extend our range, which is really important as a, as a species. So we need to basically look at how we're adjusting now by engaging the Randall cycle in those seasonal periods. We're able to increase our adiposity through the Randall cycle and become slightly fatter and actually have that in the leaner periods. That's how it works nowadays in these interglacial periods. Back then you had, because it was very cold, you had animals which had more ad adiposity to keep warm. And that was great for us because we had more energy to access from those animals. So we didn't have to waste time collecting things. Why would you? When you can bring down an animal and just gorge on it. And gorge on it for days. And that's why our gut our acidity is so low. So we can handle the bacteria that will actually grow into that, that stuff. Because it'll actually ferment over a couple of days as you're eating the mammoth. Anyway. And as I said, the N15 data is quite firm on that and clear. That's my foundation, actually, to be honest. So it is my foundation. The rest of it's just propaganda and studies that basically anybody can do, statistical gymnastics and fabricated adjustments, as we know. You know, so mm, 